Uh, everyone, wave. Over there, wave. Over there, wave. Well, I hope those ladies don't come on stage to take me off. Uh, Oh, okay, we are about ready to go. Oh yeah, I need to do this. I need to plug it in. <laughs> okay, yeah, that was an interesting introduction uh, to me. Uh, my name is Matt Taylor. Uh, I am the uh, European Space Agency Project Scientist for Rosetta, which means I am the scientific representative of the entire mission. I try and make the science that we want to do on the mission occur via my colleagues, who are the lead scientists of all the instruments, bring them together in a single view, which sounds easy, but it's not. Uh, and we try and impose our will on the people that operate the spacecraft. And hopefully after this short talk, uh, you'll find out why that's actually a challenge. So. What I'll do is talk about the solar system briefly and comets, comet observations, then go to Rosetta and 67P, and I'll tell you how to pronounce the name of the comet, and then where we are at the moment. And within that, I won't test you, uh, but this, these are the kind of things that you'll hopefully pick out of this uh, presentation. So you can take notes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I should note, actually, before I do that. Uh, this background image is from the International Space Station, um, and it's uh, a movie of sunrise, but also you can see uh, a comet coming to view, a, com a comet by Comet Lovejoy. There's a guy who's very good at spotting comets called Lovejoy, so there are a number of them, but that was one of them there. So that's what you can do when you've got a space station. Okay. Um, why are we interested in comets? Uh, we believe that about 4.6 billion years ago, there was a big ball of dust and gas that started to collapse upon itself, um, and the sun was ignited through this collapse. You then had a disk forming, we see here, spiraling in, and from this disk, did the sun ignite yet? I don't think, no, here we are, the sun's igniting um, to become the sun, and then what we have is this disk of material, and so you've got these planets, there's all planets starting to form. Um, after that, we had the planets and the moons forming, but we had all the de debris left over. These are the small bodies of the solar system that we, we investigate today. They are the asteroids, which are between Mars and Jupiter, some rocks. Uh, this is a graphical representation. It's not real, but they kind of look like this. But there's a lot of them uh, outside the orbit of Mars. You'll hear a little bit more about them later. And then further out is the more cool stuff, um, which uh, where the reservoir of the comets are. This is the Kuiper belt. This is the, the plane of the solar system where the, where the planets orbit. And then further out still, we have the Oort cloud, which is a, a, a three-dimensional sphere, as it were, which actually stretches out about a light year. If you consider the nearest star system is about four light years away, it's quite a big cloud. Excuse me. Very good cocktails. Um, so why do we look, why do we why do we look at comets? Why are they important? Um, right, you've got the picture. That they're very far away. But, but after this disk formed, and the planets formed, and this debris was kind of scattered around. You have the asteroid belts, but then you also have the comets, the reservoir of the comets. These belts. They were left there in deep freeze, so they had relative pristine material existing in, within them from the early stages of the solar system. So we look at those as being a clue as to where we came from, ultimately. So the, the planets, but also why we're here. We, we look at them as being a, a retainer for, um, for organics, for, for water. Now, were they prevalent in the early solar system? Why are we here on Earth? Why are we the only one that has a lot of water and some kind of life. <laughs> uh, okay, what's a comet? Um, it's basically a very small block of uh, black ice, basically. It's very small. This is a, an image of uh, Halley's Comet. But that's right inside this. Now, this is what we're familiar, ooh, this is what we're familiar with. Um, from looking at them in Earth, uh, from Earth. It's, it's, a, it's called a coma, it's his outer atmosphere, and then you have this massive tail. And that's why we, we've known them for a long time, because you could observe them from Earth, or some of them at least. They're interesting in, well, this is a, a graphical representation of the solar system, the point being that when the comet, this is actually a graphic of, of the comet we're looking at with Rosetta, there's the sun. Basically, when the comet gets closer to the sun, it becomes more active. So it's got a lot of ice in it, and that ice sublimates. Because of the pressures in space, instead of going from solid ice, what we've got at the back, 
Uh, in fact, the, uh, the CO2 is doing that, it's sublimating directly. It's going from, uh, from a solid to a gas directly. So it's a bit like a comet. That's why we build fake comets using uh, solid carbon dioxide. So they basically do this, this sublimation process. So instead of going to liquid, they go directly to gas and they lift off the dust as well and, and create this massive tail. But they do that when they get close to the sun. So we only see them when they're close to the sun. And we've seen them for the millennia. So we've seen them in Chinese text from, from way back, uh, probably 11 centuries before, uh, BC, Babylonian text, and uh, even some, uh, from, some Danish people have been looking at them as well. <laughs> This is a Babylonian text. Um, if you can read Babylonian, you'll see that it talks about Halley's Comet, uh, which seems prevalent in some of the, the observations that we've made. We know that it's Halley's Comet because we discovered Halley and then went back in time to, to see the subsequent apparitions. Uh, if you are familiar with um, some of the battles that have gone on across the English Channel, or La Manche, depending on which side of the channel you're on, um, this is from the Bay of Tapestry. Uh, talking about the Norman conquest of England. At the top, if you can read Latin, you probably can because you're all very educated and I'm not. Uh, Isti Moranti Stella, apparently that says they marvel at the star. This star is yet again Halley's Comet. So you can go to Normandy and you can actually look at this and find it. So these people are marveling at the star. They're probably the Normans going, cool, that looks like good luck. This lot uh, are not Normans. They're on the other side of the channel. That's Harold, poor, poor bugger. Um, that wasn't very good for him. But the point being here that they were um, usually some, a sign of doom, something wrong was going to happen. But again, here, depending on which side of the channel was whether something good or bad was going to happen. You can track Halley's Comet yet again from the author Mark Twain. Uh, he was born when there was a Halley apparition. And he predicted, as he says here, basically, that God had said that he would come in with a comet and he would most likely go out with a comet. He had the best way to win that bet, in fact, to predict that he was going to die the next time Halley came round, and in fact he did. I don't think he committed suicide just to prove this comment. Uh, but the point was, it's pretty quite nice, and you know, it's uh, a nice little piece to talk about here. Okay, so let's jump ahead of time, uh, in time a little bit. So we, we overtake the, the superstitious aspect of comets, and we start looking at them scientifically to understand what they really are and we use spectroscopy. We look at the wavelengths of light and how they emit different types of light to, to kind of get a feel for what they're made of. And we can see that they're active. They're not just a big glowing ball. We have all these jets of material flying off of them. Even more recently, we can look at the SOHO spacecraft. This is up at Lagrange point, just staring at the sun. And let's see if it comes back again. We've got this sun grazing comet going in. It doesn't cause this. This is uh, coincidental. But we see these fantastic displays. So these are, these are one-time comets. These probably come in from the Oort cloud, the sun grazers, and they usually don't make it past. We had Comet Ice on recently, which everyone was like, it's the best fucking comet ever. And then it didn't make it past. So it was a very nice comet, but it didn't make it past. Um, <laughs> so that's why you have to be careful when you're choosing comets to fly missions over 10 years. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> now, this, is a cool, this is a cool movie. Hopefully you can see this. Uh, you, there's a thing, this is from Solar Dynamics Observatory. You can see a thing flitting across the front of the sun. There it is there. Let me see if I can get it. It's kind of there. There. Well, I'll describe it anyway. It looks like a tadpole uh, because what it's doing, it's flying across the surface of the sun or near the surface of the sun and it's interacting with the, the tendrils of magnetic field that are pointing out from the sun's surface and the, and the plasma that's being pushed off and the tail's being disrupted and flown around and flapped all over the place. That's cool. Okay, uh, we can also look at the the kind of content of uh, of the atmosphere of, of the comet. And here, this is some data, squiggly lines um, from the Herschel Telescope. Wonderful mission. Uh, what it was doing is looking at the emission lines of different types of water, different flavors of water in the comet. And you can look at comets and different bodies in the solar system. And by looking at these different isotopic ratios, these different flavors of water, it will give you an indication of how old the comet is, where it was formed. This is a big question in terms of, again, going back to that earlier, uh, earlier kind of graphic of the solar system forming. In that early stage, there was an Earth that had some water, and then we believe the water boiled off. So there was no water left. So something must have re-delivered the water to the Earth for, for us to be here and drink cocktails. Um, 
This plot here is basically talking about the fla this flavour of water. It's a deuterium to hydrogen ratio, remember that. Um, so here's the Earth, and you can compare to other entities in the solar system. We can look at asteroids. Actually, asteroids do a good fit, so it looks like they're a viable delivery mechanism of these, this type of water. There are a lot of comets here, but they're above, they're, they're away from the Earth's ratio, as it were. But then uh, Herschel found a couple of comets that were similar. They were Jupiter-class comets, like the one that Rosetta's gone to, that had a similar type of water to that found on Earth. And when you think that other uh, cometary missions have found um, organic material, so uh, glycine, that is the building block of DNA and proteins, you could deliver water, but you could also deliver these building blocks of life. So there's this connection that we want to make. Uh, what, how do we get to where we are now? Again, general solar system evolution. In terms of impacts into the solar system, this is not a comet. Uh, this, is, this is Jupiter. I think this is Ganymede. Um, we, can, we, looked at, we, we were looking at Jupiter again with Herschel. Basically, this is a plot looking at the water again and showing there's a predominance of uh, water in the southern hemisphere. Why is that happening? Basically, Jupiter's big planets are like a magnet of comets. So they've sucked in a load of comets, and we can indicate that the, this was Schumacher-Levy way back in the 90s that impacted, I think these are Hubble uh, measurements, the southern hemisphere. All of the impacts of this multi-fragmented comet were whacking in to the southern hemisphere, sourcing that water that we were seeing in the previous plot. And in fact, from Hubble, you could see the scarring as this was impacting the upper atmosphere. So the point being that these Comets have, have come into the inner solar system, they tend to come in here and impact generally Jupiter, but earlier on they were impacting a lot of other planets, possibly the Earth. The first European deep space mission was Giotto, going to Comet Halley, which I mentioned before, has a theme in the 80s. I'm getting a bit quick. Where shall I stand to stop that doing that? I'll stand. Come on, Jelena. Uh, right, it was named after this fellow. Uh, he was a Renaissance painter, apparently, if you go on Wikipedia. You also find this guy from Star Trek, and it was not <laughs> named after him. Um, this is a plot basically showing all of the spacecraft that we had going to Halley at the time. Everyone was very excited. We had US missions, Japanese missions, uh, US, uh, Soviet missions, uh, and then his Giotto getting closest. But no, they're all whizzing by very quickly. Look, this is 73 kilometers a second and distances of hundreds of kilometers away from the comet. This is what we got from Halley. It was a famous picture, this one here anyway. It was the first uh, image of a nucleus really to show that it was a solid nucleus, that uh, emissions were coming from the sunlit side. There was some, some connection with the, with the sun. Um, there's a story here. I'll do it quickly. Does anyone know who Margaret Thatcher is? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, the story goes that she saw this, this was a big thing in the UK because there were a lot of uh, instruments involved or people, scientists involved in Halley, and, and, and uh, the, sorry, the Halley encounter with Giotto. She apparently saw this and decided that space was rubbish and she shouldn't fund it, and that set us back within the UK, so the story goes. So that's why it's taken us so long to get an astronaut, apparently. Right, you know what I look like now. Uh, this was in 1986. That's what I looked like in 1986. <laughs> At the same time... Oh, <laughs> um, you can go on YouTube and you can look at... Uh, B you can find... They're, they're technically illegal, I think, but they're BBC um, documentaries that were uploaded by a colleague of mine. Um, <laughs> But they show all of these encounters. They're fantastic documentaries because they show the science encounter, what was happening, the people running up to the screen and going, it's doing this, and they go back and go, oh, that's brilliant, yeah, it's a comet. But then they were discussing this, Rosetta. And see at the bottom here, it says comet nucleus sample return. That was the initial plan for Rosetta, was to send something to a comet, land on it, grab a bit, and then come back to Earth. That was deemed to be a little bit extravagant, to be honest with you. <laughs> Rosetta, as it is now, is quite extravagant anyway. Um, but this was a, a joint ESA NASA venture. It all fell apart, as things usually do. Um, and then we evolved to something else. I've alluded to a couple of, well, I alluded to the, the Halley Armada, all these spacecraft that went to the Halley uh, comet. We've had other missions going to comets since. Uh, Deep Space One, Stardust, and these are all of the, the comets that we've seen. I'm going to go over here for a bit, just for a, for a just quickly. Um, and you can see some of them are bowling pin shaped. They're all different, various shapes. The key thing here is that we were flying by hundreds of kilometers a second, 
uh, sorry, hundreds of kilometers distance and tens to 100 kilometers a second. So very high velocities. You know, I might stand off stage because you can't see anything because I'm standing in front of everything. Anyway, there you go. The key thing about Rosetta is, I can stand here as well now. I'll start playing piano. Um, <laughs> is that Rosetta is traveling very, very slow with respect to the comet. It's at like one meter a second now and is within 100 kilometers. So we've gone to the comet and we've rendezvoused with it and we stay by it for a very long time. Which brings me nicely into the Rosetta section of my talk. I'll try and be quick because I know they. I sat on these seats earlier on, they're really uncomfortable. Um, right, why is it called Rosetta? We have the Rosetta Stone, which the British stole from the French, from the Egyptians. There's a story there, which is a whole other talk. Uh, and also you have the Philae, Tem Philae Obelisk that was in the uh, Philae Temple of Isis. Basically these were stones that had three languages on them and they enabled Egyptologists to decipher the Egyptian hieroglyphs. And that was very important. You're filming me, aren't you? So I've just run off. I better go over here now. I'm keeping you on your toes. And my beer's over here as well. Anyway, so that, basically, so these were key in un, uh, deciphering the ancient Egyptian language, and that's what we look at Rosetta as doing. It's called that because it's key in un, unraveling or deciphering the language of our ancient solar system. What, what, was, what was it like way back when? Okay. This is Rosetta. That, from there to there, is 32 meters, um, which is the size of a basketball court, but if you're British, it's one point, just over 1.5 cr cricket pitches in length. Um, this is uh, Philae, the lander. Uh, it's about the size of a very large washing machine. This all together was about 300, uh, sorry, 3,000 kilos at launch. Over 50% of that was fuel because you need a lot of energy to get where you need to go. I'll skip through these. There are a lot of instruments. You, you've basically got the, right, we were talking before about Rosetta was originally a sample return. You go and grab it, and then you go back, and then you go to Earth to the big laboratories we have there. And the next best thing is to take the best laboratory you have to space, and that's what we've got here. We've got things that look remote sensing, so looking at different wavelengths of light, microwaves. Then we have things that taste and touch the comet, things that de de detect the gas and the dust and the plasma which I really like, um, around the comet. Then we also have the lander, which was specifically designed to scratch and sniff the comet, and it has a specific payload to do that as well. The comet we went to, Churimov Gerasimenko, what I'll let, I'll let Klim tell you how it sounds. So I'm gonna call it 67P from now on. <laughs> Um, but basically it's a Jupiter-class comet because it goes out to the Jupiter orbit. It takes about six or so years to do that orbit. Um, I was talking about uh, these sun grazers which disappear quickly, very effervescent. We needed to choose a comet that we, was periodic. We could, we could judge where it was going to be in time. So this was discovered back in the 50s uh, and we've been tracking it ever since. It became more interesting around about 2003 because Rosetta was originally going to go to a smaller comet. We had a launch delay so we had to quickly find another comet. Uh, 67P was the one that we went to, and uh, it's turned out to be a very good one. This is what we thought the comet looked like um, from Hubble observations, from, from observations from Earth, it was a grey potato. You do this by looking at something and seeing how the light reflects and, and bounces off of it and varies. So you can get an idea of the rotation rate and its rough shape. It's quite a difficult um, thing to do with the distances we're talking about. I'll skip through this. This was the journey we did um, with, so that, yeah, that last slide was just talking about the science that we knew before we actually got there. Um, this is the journey we, we, we made. We launched in 2004. We had to fly past the Earth uh, three times and then Mars once because even though we had all that fuel, we still couldn't get out to this orbit. We had to chase down the comet, get out to the orbit of the comet to enable us to do the science that we want to do. And it took 10 years. In that time, we were able to investigate the Earth, and Mars, various things. I'll skip through this for the want of time and your sore buttocks. Um, one thing, we took a selfie at Mars. This is now apparently what you do. Curiosity does this. It does an arrow. It says, this is my science target. So this is Mars, if you didn't recognize it. Um, this is taken from the, uh, the Philae's camera system, Shiva, looking like it sits there, poo style, a bit like my belly, um, and then looks down the solar panels. There's a number of those that we've done. Um, has anyone heard of the Chainsmokers song, Let Me Take a Selfie? Anyone? 
Uh, I thought it'd be a good idea once to put that in the background of this and let it come in when they go, let me take a selfie. Uh, I did it at this uh, amateur astronomy society and I nearly caused two deaths because the average age was around 55 or 60. <laughs> so that's why you didn't hear any music when this came in. Um, part of the science that we wanted to do on the way to the comet was to look at some asteroids. Uh, so we went to asteroid Steins and asteroid Lutitia. I'm going to go over here so everyone can see it. Keep the cameraman on his toes. Um, you can see this one here is a bit blurry, and Lutitia, well, they're much bigger. This is only about six kilometers across. This one's 100 or so. This is a bit blurry, isn't it? Now, apparently, as the conspiracy theorists had it, the, the reason we flew Rosetta was because this was an alien spaceship, and that the reason it was blurry was because we held all the data. That that's, that diamond-shaped object is a, is, a, is a spaceship, but it's not. But then, would you believe me, because I'm the man. Um, <laughs> But it is. It's actually formed from physical processes of the interaction of single photons, actually, with the, with the side of the asteroid that shape the, 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 the gravitational interaction of, of the, the material on the, on the... It's very interesting. Uh, there's a nice uh, cavity here, an impact crater, and you can see the de detrius around it, the, the debris. It gives you an idea of the age of these things. So we were able to characterize these bodies on the way to doing this. Oh yeah, we're at deep space. Right, so we got so far away that even though we had these massive solar panels, 64 square meters of solar panels, we still didn't have enough energy to power the spacecraft, so we put the thing to sleep, completely asleep. 2011. And just before we did that, we pointed at the comet. This is the Osiris science camera, wide angle, then going into near angle. And then this very noisy field, you can pick out the comet in that red disc. And I'll stand here, because then everyone has maximum apart from my belly. Um, okay, so it went to sleep, and meanwhile on Earth, right, I moved from this fantastic mission, uh, the cluster mission, to the Rosetta mission in 2013. So you're getting basically everything I know about Rosetta here, because uh, I've only been on the project a little bit. It's been a bit of a whiz-bang tour. I'm going to do a quick sojourn into the magnetosphere. Cluster is a fantastic European Space Agency mission. It's still flying. It's got four spacecraft that investigate the plasma interaction of the sun with the Earth's magnetic field, the outer atmosphere of the sun. And I'm only doing this because I want to show you this, a picture of a launch I went to last week. Uh, this is NASA's new version of, uh, of Cluster. So it's a fantastic mission. You can see it being rolled out to a launch pad in Florida. And uh, the, the lady that took these videos, you probably saw her flack flicking in and, out, in and out there. This was the launch. And this is what it looks like, taken from an iPad. Boom. I'm, sorry, I'm really excited because it's the first launch I ever saw, so I had to show it. But it's a, it's a really nice mission, and we're going to work with NASA, with, with, our, with our spacecraft cluster, um, to, to investigate how this interaction works. It's, it's basically the physics behind how the... You probably may know what the aurora is. I've never seen it because I live very too far south. But it's what drives the aurora, and uh, we're trying to investigate how that works. Back to Rosetta. Okay, um, during this time period, there are things being developed in terms of looking at how the ground-based community can look at it. So the people on the Earth, how they can point their telescopes. We have professionals and also amateurs, uh, led by dear Padma here, and this is only just open recently. So if you were interested in ground-based astronomy as an amateur, you can go to this web page, you can ask me about it later, uh, or just Google it like you do, like kids do. Um, but that's nice stuff, and we also have, we were doing simulations as well to see what we thought was going to happen. This is still ongoing. We also, from the ground, were taking images to make sure the comet was still there, because that's always a worry. <laughs> it was. Then we started a bit of a PR thing. We started ramping up. It was new for ESA in some sense, that now people may know what ESA is. We started this whole Wake Up Rosetta thing. Everyone was shouting at the spacecraft to wake it up. Um, I was. 20th of January. Right. Well, I told you about I was on Cluster, the Cluster mission. When I told my mum I'd moved to Rosetta, I'd taken a year. Every time I talked to my mum, I'd say, right, mum, this is, what do you do? What is it that you do as a scientist? I'm like, plasma physics, really hard, and blah, 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 Cluster. She's like, yeah, whatever. And I was like, mum, I'm moving to Rosetta. He's going to a comet. She's like, oh, I know what comets are, yeah. Cool. I'm like, yeah, I know that. And she said, there's a song called Rosetta by this famous uh, guys from the 70s, Alan Price and Georgie Fame. It's a song called Rosetta. I was like, I'll look, I'll look this up. And this was before the wake up. This might be loud, so be warned. 
Um, the poignant thing is the chorus. Right, actually there's some people that you'll see later on, some of the people that work on Rosetta have the same haircuts. Um, <laughs> I thought that was quite poignant for our wake up and it actually became a bit viral within ESA, well some of us, uh, and they hated me for it because it was like an earworm that gets in there. Uh, it, I thought it was good, I, that's what we were wondering, is Rosetta better, is it still alive, we didn't know, we had no idea before the wake up. Um, the song loses track after this because it's actually a song about a woman who gets drunk all the time on whiskey. <laughs> you can Google that as well. And it was, so we were all waiting for this to happen, this carrier signal to come from Rosetta, because we had no idea whether the spacecraft was there, whether it was okay, and it was. And much joy was had around ESOC. Uh, this is uh, Emily, uh, she is at ESOC Rosetta, she's the, she's the, the, the main uh, tweeter there. You can see not all of them, this is kind of the family of uh, people that have been in charge of the spacecraft. Andrea Camazzo, uh, Paolo Ferri, and Manfred Vorhalt are kind of like, I think he's a great-grandfather, grandfather, father, and now you've got the next generation, Sylvain Lodio, which might come up in one of my slides. This progression of experience through the mission, because it's lasted this long. And that's why they're looking that happy. This guy spent 18 years of his life on this mission. Made a nice little graphic. Um, this is an image from the, this is the Ptolemy instrument from the lander. These are the guys in Open University in the UK. This is Colin Pillinger, if you're aware. He passed away uh, recently. He was key in, in, in this mission, also Mars and Beagle 2. Um, and I've recently been giving talks about him and, and Rosetta. So it was nice that he saw this. It's a shame he didn't get to live long enough to see that Philae got down, but that's for later on. This is Catherine Altveig. She is the PI, the principal investigator of the Rosina instrument. It's a gas spectrometer. It's a fantastic instrument. I'll be talking about that later, but it's always very good to have one PI smiling. I'm supposed to get all of the PI smiling, but usually Catherine isn't very happy with me, so I, I, I have this on my wall in my office to remind me <laughs> that sometimes she can be happy. And actually, this is Hans Bolziger. He was the PI of one of the instruments on, on Giotto as well. So you have this progression and this evolution of people on board the missions. So we got a bit of a splash. Um, people were beginning to get interested in things. Um, you can monitor this by how many people are look, following us on Twitter. You can look at hashtags and see how they percolate through the world. And we were starting to get reaches of about 17 million people through the Wake Up Rosetta hashtag and, and various other entities. All right, so we woke up successfully and uh, we had to approach the comet. We had to rendezvous with it. And that was the next di difficult thing, because that's the first time this has ever been done. So we've done all this 10-year journey, now we've got to get to the comet, rendezvous with it, walk alongside it, and then do this little deployment of a lander malarkey. That's where we were when we came out of hibernation. We were travelling at 800 metres a second, 9 million kilometres away from the comet. We had to, in those months, get down to walking pace, 1 metre a second, and then 100 kilometers. And then we started running this PR campaign, which if you have kids, you're familiar with. It's kind of the whole thing of if you're driving a long journey and then there are people in the back going, are we there yet? I need a wee. <laughs> which is quite poignant for uh, the characters we have uh, with Rosetta and Philae. So we came on, we, we, we started testing the instruments. This is the navigation camera. You won't see the comet here because we're actually looking in the opposite direction. But this is good to see that we're starting to see the instruments come online. This is from uh, Osiris, the science eyes, and this is the first uh, observation in the main phase last year of the comet. Uh, this was, again, from ground. We were still monitoring because you want that comparison from ground-based. Everything we do at Rosetta, we're monitoring from the ground. So any measurement we make, we can put into context with the ground-based observations, then you can apply that to any other observation that we've made before. That's what makes Rosetta so cool. Oh, right, who can spot the comet? There it is. <laughs> so we were gradually approaching, and then we were doing a bit more science. We sit down, this is the comet, in the, 
and it started to it, it had a little outburst and this we can see here this is basically kind of the light coming off of it and we saw this little burst and it went back down to normal activity we're still trying to work out what that was actually so this is the first inference we saw and we're getting very excited and here is a basically looking at this, this blip I was talking about before when you look at how the light varies this is how you measure the rotation rate when you're still far away and we started to get calculate or calculate what the rotation rate of the comet was are we there yet we eventually rendezvoused with the comet This was the cleanest, that these, this is basically the thruster temperatures, that's the cleanest that's ever seen them. So everyone was like, well that was, you know, wasn't that exciting, but it was, because every time you do something to a spacecraft it can go wrong. So we were still worried, even though it was that last in a chain of actually 10 major manoeuvres to slow down that 800 metres a second to 1 metre a second, it was still a big deal. And we were happy. And so we had this competition, are we there yet? People were submitting their story there, you know, are we there yet? Basically a guy with his message in a bottle, a rosetta in a bottle diving. Um, there's a mountain climber, Andrea Akamatsu, the, the flight director, is very keen on mountain climbing. So, you know, if you want to win a competition at ESOC, that's basically go on a mountain and then Andrea will select it. <laughs> right, this is what I was going to get at. Now this is the, the rendezvous. We started to see peaks in people watching what was going on. So the Rosetta hashtag was getting 200 million. Um, the Are We There Yet was getting 12 million, which is pretty good. Very soon after this, we went from this was our comet, no, to this. Um, so we found out this fantastic shape. Uh, and we were talking about what to name it scientifically, or with, and you'll see it later with respect to Egyptian hieroglyphs and Egyptian terminology, but the duck has stuck. Uh, we have, when you're talking to somebody on the phone, whether it be a colleague scientifically or a journalist, when you say the head of the duck or the body of the duck or the neck or the right wing or the left wing, it just works. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> to the extent that we also have the hemi duck. Uh, so you have a hemisphere normally when you talk about northern and southern hemisphere, we have the northern hemi duck and the southern <laughs> hemi duck. Anyway, so. You have, now we know, that the, the, the actual the dimensions that we got from the earlier observations are quite accurate, around about four kilometres. But we have this weird shape, we have this diverse morphology, which I'll show more later on, I better crack on now. Um, if you know what London looks like, that would be what London, you'd be scared crapless if you were down there. Uh, but um, There you go, for, for, for dimensions. When we did the approach, uh, we had the navigation camera, so you can see this is just the frames as we're approaching. I'll stand here to maximise everyone's view. Um, and all the time we're doing manoeuvres, or every now and again we're doing manoeuvres, and sometimes you overcook your manoeuvre. And this is what happens here. So we did our manoeuvre too well. <laughs> so that's why the comet is now disappearing off the screen. Um, <laughs> This is important though, the navigation camera, we need this because the, the signals take about half an hour to get to the comet, or to the spacecraft. So it's an, an hour return journey kind of thing. It's autonomous, or semi-autonomous, so we really rely on the, the spacecraft being able to navigate where it is with respect to the comet all the time, which complicates things greatly. And this is the classic shot of uh, the, the Klingon warbird, or whatever it is, the Romulan warbird. Talking of uh, conspiracy theories, there's another video which is 380,000 views, um, apparently from somebody from the ESA, which means that they are obviously from the US because I don't think anyone in Europe calls it the ESA. Um, and also the fact that they start, uh, they start attacking NASA within about one minute uh, and the US government. This vent hole here, which is actually very interesting scientifically, they say that shopped on, it's not really there. Uh, there's actually a dome structure, there's also something down here which looks like uh, an aircraft hangar with the jeep tracks around it. <laughs> it's a comet. <laughs> Um, this, is, this is an image from, from the Earth, this is from the uh, European Southern Observatory. Uh, as, uh, that is, is the comet, this is the coma of the comet, the outer atmosphere. So basically, Rosetta and the comet are right in one pixel of that, and this is 19,000 kilometers uh, across here. And that was way back then, it's much bigger than that now. So we started to do measurements, I'm going to probably skip through a lot of these. We're, we're looking at the surface temperature, how the, how the surface reacts with the radiation from the sun. This plot here, all I want to show you is that 
Visibly, oh, well, we're starting to see more of it now, but for a long time we could only see about 70% of the comet because of the way that the comet was rotating with respect to the sun. We can only see the sunlit side. But we have this microwave instrument that can actually see the dark side, as it were. Um, and that's what you can see here. This is actually why this plot goes out to the left because Miro can see the dark bit. So this is the model from the visible camera, but then you can extend it if you use the other measurements. This, this, uh, this instrument, Miro, can also look at the, 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 the way the water's coming off. So this was the first measurement that we were making of how much water was coming off of the comet. That was equivalent to two of these small cups, so 300 millilitres of water per second. The equivalent measurement here is if you're in your back garden, this was back in June, I think, July, you stand in your back garden, you look at the moon, and you can say, right, I've just seen two cups of water come off of the moon in the last second. So that's the equivalent of this measurement, which is quite good. Remember the questions. The comet does smell. Um, these are some of the things that we've measured with the Rosina instrument. Remember, very happy Catherine Altweg. Uh, this is an instrument uh, that, that has made these, these measurements. We've got the water, we've made this measurement with other instruments, but in particular we've, we've detected methane, um, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, formaldehyde. Later on I'll tell you a story about beer. It's a really good one. Um, but anyway, this gives you a kind of a, a spread of all the things that we're starting to sniff from the comet. So if you think uh, ammonia, methane, uh, hydrogen sulfate, rotten eggs, horse urine, alcohol, so it's kind of probably what it'll smell like later on in here. Ah... <laughs> uh. <laughs> We can also look at what's being emitted from the surface, again locally, and we're starting to look at the different types of water, different types of ice and gases, that, and they seem to vary depending on where we are. And that's something that's really strange, and we're trying to work out whether that's to do with the surface itself or how it's illuminated. And that's still an ongoing process. This is basically what these bumps and wiggles are doing, that we've got correlations at certain points when we're at certain viewing angles of the comet. And remember, this is stuff that's coming to the comet. Um, oh, sorry, coming to the spacecraft. So these are all the things we're starting to look at now, starting to find out about the comet. I, I made uh, a comment earlier on about measuring different types of water, different flavours of water, and we're doing that with, uh, with Rosetta as well. We knew that Rosina, the instrument, would do very well at measuring water because it measures everything around the, at the spacecraft. It can measure, water basically comes out of the thrust, it's a byproduct of the thrusters, it comes off, the spacecraft is just dirty, or, you know, it can, this, this instrument can smell everything. We have what's known as a high gain antenna, and that is an actuated one, it can point in different directions. This instrument can sniff the grease that is in, uh, so when this moves, it can smell the grease, and this is one of the spikes that we see here. What, what I'm getting at, ramblingly, um, is that we knew that we could do a good measurement of water, and when we got to the comet here, we, we were able to make a very good measurement of water. And it was saying that for our comet, remember the last ones, this is the same plot that I showed before, these other Jupiter-class comets were similar to Earth. <clears throat> but the one we've got is not like all of the other Jupiter-class comets, it's got a very high flavour of water, this, this D to H ratio. It means that it's actually a very old object. It's been in the Kuiper belt, right on the outskirts of the solar system for a very long time. We've also got another measurement of nitrogen. You can look at particular components, different molecules and their ratio with other molecules. It gives you an idea of how the comet was formed. And by looking at those, again, it, it, it enables you to constrain the formation and the situation that the comet was in when it was formed. So this is all kind of new stuff that we're trying to piece together to get an idea of the evolution cycle. I'm going to skip through some of this. This is basically talking about the dust. We've seen dust far away from the comet. It seems to be there from the last time we went round the sun, and then there's new dust being formed closer by. And we're seeing different types of dust. This is an instrument called Cosima, which is basically, it's a bit like when you put your hand outside the car on a sunny on a summer's day and you get bits of bug stuck to your hand. That's what it does. So you see on the left, this is before it sticks its hand out of Rosetta, or it doesn't, it, anyway. Uh, it reveals its target, and then you get this dust coming from the comet. And what the, the Cosima team do, they, they name these, different names, so here we have Alui and Arvid for these particular dust grains, but they had a, one of these is called Boris, I think, and they shoot them uh, with an iron gun. It's uh, not very nice, but then they do, to do that, see what is emitted, so you, they get all of this, these uh, spectroscopic results to say that there's a lot of sodium in there, there's magnesium, this is a nice result because we've seen sodium in the tail of the comet, this is the first time we've detected it in a piece of dust. This is another measurement of, um, of dust as well. This is actually a microscope that touches pieces of dust. 
Uh, but it went wrong, so I won't. It, it's, it's doing better now. Uh, but it's a really, really cool instrument. It's actually going to do a 3D rendering of dust grain. I mean, that you get so much information from that. I know it sounds, oh, so what? But it's really important to understand the structure of these things as they come on board. Uh, it gives you an idea of where they come from, how they were formed, whether they were pre-solar, whether they're interstellar particles, as it were. Um, plasma. Uh, we can also look at how the sun ionizes the, the water or the, the gas that's coming off of the comet and then diverts it around the comet because you then have an electric field in the solar wind and it does all this cool stuff. And we're just starting to see that form, that, di that, that formation of a, ma a magnetosphere, a bit like we have on the Earth. So we're starting to see that now. We may even be starting to see uh, the formation of a bow shot because the solar wind is supersonic. So we're seeing a, a big ridge of plasma in front of us, a big uh, a cloak, as it were. So it's all cool stuff going on. I forgot about this. This is actually a sonification of the magnetic field data showing how current fluctuations in the solar wind and the, and the, and the comet this is what they, they cause these wake-like effects as you go as you, as the solar wind is passing past the uh, the comet, and they sonify, they upscale by ten thousand hertz, I think, to get this sound. Ten thousand, no, five point eight million people have downloaded this, and we've had, I think, a dubstep version. Somebody was singing <laughs> the Universe song by the Beatles, um, so it's quite popular. I've always said that because I'm a plasma physicist, so. Um, right, quickly, um, these are invites. So basically you can look at different wavelengths of light or subtle filters in the visible uh, wavelength. Um, you can see that some parts of the comet are similar, other parts aren't. These are things that we're starting to dig into. What I'm going to talk about here very quickly is the fact that the gravity on the comet is very low. Oh yeah, I've got to crack on now. Um, they found it, okay. Um, if you can jump or kick. Um, if you can jump like four centimetres on Earth, you can leave the, the, the comet forever. And here is just indicating the fact that, we, that the comet is very dark, very black, and we have a lot of organics on board. Right, I'm going to skip forward now because the suitcase is telling me. It compels me. Um, <laughs> We're seeing very strange things uh, on the surface. They're like wind-driven uh, features, which are really weird. Uh, but they're not the same as you see on Earth. They're driven by a different process. It's a very low-gravity environment. I'll skip through this. Uh, we're also seeing these boulders, these blocks. We named this Cheops after the whole theme of Egypt, um, which is the same. So this is the, the, the Cheops uh, pyramid in, in Giza, so for scale. We're also seeing these features in these pits, remember the, the conspiracy theory pit, um, that, that are all the same size. It's giving us this indication of how the comets were formed. Well, I've got to do the whole, well, I'm going to skip through this, I've got to do the whole story. Yeah, there's a crack in the neck as well, we don't know what that is. Um, it could mean that the thing's going to break up. We then went through a process of the most uh, complex manoeuvres that we've ever done uh, operationally within ESA. We gradually spiralled down to about 10 kilometres to, to map the comet, to do this, to, 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 to decide where we were going to land. So this is in Toulouse in the summer. We were spending weekends trying to go through how to select this, and eventually we selected um, Site J for the landing. So in September and October we did some more selfies. That's a comet. That's a comet. In selfies, duck face. There is a duck face there, technically. <laughs> and then we did the maneuver to get out and do the lander deployment. We went out to 23 kilometers and then deployed. This was the day, the night before at nine o'clock where we thought everything was going to go wrong. There's Andrea, there's Fred Janssen, uh, Sylvain and others, uh, Ilsa. Uh, Stefan Ulamek, the, the land lead site or project manager, because there were a few things going wrong. So we went through a procedure of saying, right, this is how we're going to go forward now. Um, and by three o'clock, we'll know. So I, I had a couple of drinks in the bar, and then by three o'clock, we knew that everything was going to go ahead. But it was a tense time the night before. And then skip forward a couple of hours later. This is the camera from Shiva, from the, from the lander, pointing at the orbiter. It's, it's blurred because the, the lander's spinning at that time. And then we have this fantastic image which we like because it said that the, the legs are deployed and we're starting to go down to the surface. This is from the, the lower side of the lander, um, the, the Rolis camera from about 40 meters up. This is about five meters across. And we landed. That's me there, and there's Manfred again, like Garfield stuck to the, uh, to the glass. Um, this was afterwards. Now, that was what it was like at ESOP, but in Cologne where the lander operations were carried out, 
Um, they were a bit concerned because they had already seen that the lander wasn't doing what it's supposed to. It was doing this. This is the first image from the surface of the comet which shows you something was wrong afterwards. Uh, the software broke down and it was blurred because it was still moving. Uh, this is the before and after. There's a dent there. That's the before and after image of the, the surface impact. And this is better shown with this set of images. Before and after you can see the, the, the dents formed by the lander legs. And then that's the last image we have of the lander. Some of the lander instruments have actually taken measurements at this point. That's the noise <laughs> of the lander hitting. So it's an acoustic sensor. That's actually what it would sound like if you could hear in space. So you can't hear a lander land on something, and you can't scream in space either. Um, uh, okay, magnetic field also could so we could trace where it was landing, where it was hitting these three points across the comet, and this is where we finally came to rest in a ditch. Uh, we were able, we're starting to look at where we're oriented. This is in one direction. You can make a nice uh, juxtaposition of the fact that this is about 20 years old and this is 4.6 billion years old. Uh, this is actually looking up. Uh, there's a, a cliff or some kind of overhang and this, this bright stuff is the sunlight glinting off of the lander onto the underhang. We have to tune this a bit to get the light out. We can also use a, a measurement uh, of, of a sounder to see where we are. This is roughly where we think we are and we're still looking. We got within about 120 meters of where we were supposed to target from 23 kilometers, which is pretty damn good. But the lander didn't want to land there, it wanted to go over here somewhere. This is uh, Vicente Companies, who's one of the main flight dynamics guys who steers the spacecraft, tells us what we can do. So, and this is Stefan Ulamak, the guy who's in charge of the lander. So they're quite happy that they actually got down in the end. Quick now. Does so anyone know what Blade Runner, the Blade Runner film, Vangelis? Uh, this is some of the, the music he made for the landing. So we became quite popular on the internet and we had Vangelis. Uh, we had our feature film uh, for seven minutes, uh, Ambition. We did a number of other things. We got a Google Doodle and then we got the Google end of year thing. Um, we even had astronauts uh, showing us how difficult it was to land on a comet by throwing earplugs at one of these uh, robots. <laughs> This is Alexander Gerst. This was not the first time he tried. Um, at the bottom here that you can't really see is actually, uh, they were, people were prompted, do you know what Rosetta is? And these are the percentage uh, correct answers. They knew what Rosetta was. This is between 69 and 70% across Italy. UK is the end at the lowest. Um, that's 69%, but people were aware of what Rosetta was. This is me and my daughter and my son doing uh, an outreach activity at Estec, where I come from in, in Nordwijk. Uh, they were helping me because even though I've lived in the Netherlands for 10 years, I can't speak Dutch, so they were doing a Dutch for me. But it was fantastic to work with my kids. They saw, for once, they realized that dad does something that's quite cool. My daughter's now talking about doing physics because she was able to talk to the Dutch kids to, to basically translate what I was telling them when we were making these fake comments out of uh, CO2. Uh, so that was one of the best things that's happened to me. <laughs> Working with your kids. Right, what are we doing now? Uh, I'm making everyone at the Science Operations Centre get tattoos. Um, <laughs> One of, the, one of the main challenges that we have is this comet is developing dynamically all the time, so it's trying to push the spacecraft away, so we have to make two plans at any one time. One that we want to fly, one that is a safe plan. That's what all of this says, believe me. Uh, most recently, we did a very close flyby. We went within six kilometers of, uh, of the comet. This is a graphical representation where we use for planning purposes to show you where we're um, going across the lower half. This is the Imatep region. Uh, and so we did this flyby and we got within six kilometers. And so here is basically the region. So I think, uh, yeah, that, that, uh, that pyramid's up here somewhere. Um, right, so this bit here, and then we get here. This is the full frame image. Um, so it's 225 meters across. Each pixel's about 11 centimeters. This stain here is actually the shadow of the spacecraft on the comet surface. Um, and this is a zero phase, so there's not many shadows because the sun's coming right from behind the spacecraft near enough. Uh, you can see there are a couple of frames that show this actually moving, so it's not, it's not like a dog has weed on the surface of the comet, it is actually the shadow of the spacecraft. And that was very pleasing to see. And so after this we'll do a number of different flybys, we'll fly further away, we'll do all these fancy things and we're trying to work out what we can do better as well. Because the comet's starting to become more active. I think this is a recent one from last week. We can see these jets of uh, activity coming off. Well, we'll be continuing to do this all this year, hopefully into next year as well. So we'll go through closest approach when the comet becomes the most active it will be. 
and then it starts to die off again. And we want to work out why that's doing that and what the changes are. We'll observe a change in the, in the size, the volume of the, of the comet. The surface features will change. Right, I'm nearly, nearly finished now, so the, com the uh, suitcase won't blow up, hopefully. Um, but basically, Rosetta is the first mission to shadow a comet, and it's a walking pace. It's the first time we've ever landed on a comet as well. Um, it's done the most we've ever done with a comet already, but it's going to do much, much more. And hopefully, maybe I've answered most of these questions. Um, if not, you get to stay tuned to, to the next act, as it were. And also, if you want to follow Rosetta, that's where you should go. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.